Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Sanchez Parkinson, and I serve as the Director of Partnerships, Programs, and Research for the C Fund. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar on Black College Student Mental Health, what institutions need to know and do to support healing and thriving in a time of racial crisis. This timely event is a partnership of the National Center for Institutional Diversity at the University of Michigan and the C Fund, a national nonprofit organization focused on supporting the mental health and emotional well being of young people of color. Today's focus on the college context reflects the fact that, along with academic impacts, college context can serve to support or challenge students' personal development and well being in critical ways shaping their pathways and adjustments into and through adulthood. Increasingly, researchers and higher education institutions are paying attention to college student mental health, but less of this focus has considered the specific contextual experiences, challenges, and supports relevant to Black student mental health. Today's webinar will feature the work of three scholars actively engaged in research on the positive mental health of Black college students. All are grant recipients of the 2020 NCID C Fund pop-up grant program cycle themed around mental health among marginalized communities. Each scholar will share research findings yielded from their grant projects and outline specific implications and recommendations for research and action. Following, we will engage all three presenters in a panel discussion about their work in the context of our current times including taking participant questions. So please feel free to send those in. To proceed, our moderator, Dr. Tabby Chavis, NCID Director and Professor of Education and Psychology at the University of Michigan, will provide some framing remarks and then introduce our scholar presenters. Dr. T Tabby Chavis. Thank you, Laura, and to the Steve Fund for its partnership and commitment uh, and act, uh, to action and awareness to support the positive mental health among youth of color. Good afternoon, everyone. As Laura notes, college contexts are important in students' academic and psychological development. In addition, research shows that along with the social and academic challenges of college experienced by all students, Black college students routinely report negative race-related experiences in their campus academic and social settings. For example, microaggressions and discrimination, bias stereotype-based treatment, and low expectations. In, pre in predominantly white settings in particular, Black students ironically report both isolation and exclusion, invisibility, and hypervisibility, being over-monitored as suspicious and dangerous, for instance, due to their race. Black students' racially marginalizing experiences are sometimes tied to their multiple identities, their race along with their ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status, or sexual orientation, among other identities they hold. Such stigmatizing ex experiences have been linked to poor academic achievement and persistence outcomes, and these experiences likely function to undermine mental health as well. We are starting to see these patterns among both undergraduate and graduate students, thus representing a broad range of emerging adults being impacted by campuses that may be unwelcoming or where students view their cultural backgrounds and contributions as devalued. Now more than ever, a focus on black college student mental health is critical. In early 2020, black students' college experiences, like many others, were suddenly and violently disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic, which disproportionately impacted black communities in virus incidents, death rates, and economic impacts. In fall 2020, Black students entered or re-entered their college campuses in person or remotely after a summer of widespread protests against anti-Black police violence and systemic racism, sparked by public witnessing of videos depicting murders and brutalizing of Black Americans by police, protests which have continued into the present and have been further inflamed by the current political season including overt discourse and behaviors of white supremacy from the nation's president, maybe not for long, to local communities and campuses. Many of these black students, emerging adults who are learning about their identities and how the world regards their identities as they enter and navigate college, also carried with them a new awareness and knowledge that, did, that the differential impacts of COVID-19 are directly and indirectly due to systemic racism. That said, while the pandemic and current racial crisis are new, systemic racism in higher education and society is not. And 
Historically and currently, Black students have brought and bring many personal and cultural strengths to their campuses that they draw on to maintain motivation to persist and succeed, and that can be leveraged to support their positive college adjustment, including their mental health. For instance, our research and that of other scholars demonstrates that Black students' ties to their cultural and racial identities and to their cultural communities can help mitigate or buffer the negative impacts of racially stigmatizing college experiences such as discrimination and biased treatment. In other words, despite the challenges of racism, many Black students show college resilience. But just because Black students are resilient does not mean we should leave Black students out there to survive and thrive in college by their own efforts only. And all students aren't resilient in the same ways. For instance, some students' efforts to be academically resilient in negative campus racial climates can come at the cost of their mental health and well being. Thus, higher education must be accountable in understanding Black student experiences and, importantly, acting on this knowledge to meet the goals of supporting and serving all students equitably so they can thrive and meet the goals they set, they've set for themselves. Our focus today on Black students also reflects a need for researchers and institutions to employ non-comparative approaches when considering the experiences of communities of color. There's a history in social science, health science, in science, and uh, of, of researchers employing methods in which Black participants are compared to a white control group or norm, usually compared as deficient relative to the white group or norm or more recently relying only on methods that only aggregate black students with other URM or underrepresented groups or aggregate students of student of color groups regardless of the research questions. While a focus on students of color more broadly is important and communities of color can have many shared experiences that are useful to understand, we also find it important to disaggregate research findings for different racial and ethnic groups and also take within group approaches in theory development and research design. This helps us consider variation in the nature of students' contextual experiences, which may be based in societal images, stereotypes, and historical statuses around different groups. For example, anti-Blackness in the US, rooted in a history of slavery and dehumanization, may uniquely impact Black students, showing up, for instance, in reported experiences of being treated with fear or suspicion, or interactions based on stereotypes of anti-intellectualism, and the ways that race, gender, and social class interact to impact Black students' experiences may play out in unique ways. For instance, for instance, gendered experiences and treatment related to phenotypes, such as skin tone and hair, as well as gendered stereotypes and social constructions around sexuality and emotional expression that play out differently for Black women and men. Furthermore, Black students are not a monolith. Different individuals within the group may vary in their contextual experiences and or responses to those experiences based on a range of individual differences and background characteristics. So it's complex. But embracing this complexity is critical to help us best serve and support Black students and all of their diversity and strengths. In that spirit, I'm very honored to introduce our presenter panelists. As noted, they are among a group of 2020 NCID Steve Fund grant awardees. All are outstanding scholars of Black students' identity, development, and mental health processes, and their projects were selected for both their theoretical and research merits, as well as their potential for supporting positive action and social transformation. So first, I am pleased to introduce our first presenter and panelist, Dr. Shauna Leith, Assistant Professor of Community Psychology at the University of Virginia. Professor Leith's grant was entitled, A Mixed Methodological Investigation of Institutional Climate, Mental Health Service Utilization, and Wellness Among Black College Students at a Predominantly White Institution and a Minority Serving Institution. This was conducted in collaboration with Dr. Martinique Jones, who we'll also hear from later. Professor Leith will discuss how Black college students contend with culturally specific concerns, systemic inequality, discrimination, and marginalization based in their multiple social, social identities, which can undermine their mental health and academic performance. She notes that despite their need, many Black students are hesitant to seek mental health services for various reasons, including stigma attached to help seeking. However, few studies have investigated the role of Black students' college context how their institutional climates may help explain their service utilization and subsequent wellness and college adjustment outcomes. 
To address this question in, the, in their grant project, professors Leith and Jones utilized multiple data sets secondary data from the Healthy Mind Study, a national most multi-institutional study of college contexts, and qualitative data they collected from Black students attending two culturally and demographically distinct universities. In today's session, Professor Leeds will present part of their larger project, findings from the Healthy Mind Survey Study and qualitative interview data from a sample of Black students enrolled at the University of Virginia during the August 11th and 12th, 2017 alt-right protests with a focus on institutional whiteness and the psychosocial impacts of racialized hate crimes on college campuses. Now, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Leith. Thank you, Dr. Chavis. I'm going to start screen sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as Dr. Shavis mentioned, I'm going to talk about um, a collaborative project that I have with Dr. Jones um, that looks at institutional climate, mental health service utilization, and college adjustment among Black students at a PWI and a minority serving institution. And I'm really excited to talk about two of the papers um, that have already come out of this project, as well as um, future directions for other projects that we have planned. But first, just briefly about how I got here, so I was already introduced um, in the bio. I received my PhD in education and psychology from the University of Michigan in 2019. And one of the great things about being in the combined program in education and psychology was that I was able to think about African American students in multiple contexts. And so thinking about their developmental trajectories in education, um, using a psychological lens, and then also thinking about how educational outcomes are informed in family contexts and by different community settings that we're in. Uh, another thing that really drew me to the program in Michigan was the Center for the Study of Black Youth in Context. So when I was applying to grad school and I saw CISBIC, um, as we call it, I was blown away by the idea that there was so much research going on on the Black community specifically. So thinking about racial socialization and racial discrimination and racial identity formation and with an explicit focus on Black youth's cultural um, and individual strengths. And so that was a, a huge push for me to apply um, and to attend there. And I think one of the really important things about that training is that then anything that I'm writing, the grants or manuscripts, I'm always thinking from this strengths-based perspective about how do we challenge deficit-based narratives of Black students and really focus on resistance um, and some of the, the beautiful things that are happening within the Black community and in a different setting. And now I'm currently um, an assistant professor in my second year at the University of Virginia. And my research has more so shifted um, to focusing explicitly on Black women and girls. And so thinking about their intersectional identities, of race and gender and social class and thinking again about holistic development um, within different settings. So again, looking at family, educational settings, um, community settings, et cetera. So then we get to the NCID project itself um, specifically. During my time in Michigan, I met a fellow sister scholar, Dr. Martinique Jones, and we had overlapping interests. Um, I had done quite a bit of work on institutional climate and Dr. Jones, I won't say too much since she'll be talking to us soon, but she's a mental health clinician and she had this very explicit interest in thinking about Black women's wellness and how Black students access college services. And so when the Steve Fund call came out, we got together and we said, hey, you know, do you want to put together a project? We're thinking about similar things. Um, and wonderfully, our project was funded. So let me get into the first study that I'll be talking about, um, which looks at linked faith in mental health. And then I'll go into a second study that focuses on Black student resilience. And then I'll spotlight what's coming next with some of the papers that we have planned. So the project goals one was to use secondary survey data, as Tabby mentioned, um, the Healthy Mind Study, which I'll talk about a bit more, to examine the associations among Black students' perceptions of institutional climate and their mental health service utilization. So again, how they're seeking help from counseling services on campus. And then we also collected data. So the first part of the project was using this existing nationally representative set. And the second part of the project was to collect our own data um, through semi-structured individual interviews with Black students in two different institutional contexts. So really thinking about what does it mean to be at a predominantly white institution compared to a minority serving institution and how black students access services and to promote their wellness and their sense of adjustment. And so we also collected interview data um, in April of 2020, which is a very interesting time to say the least to be collecting data on mental health and institutional climate since COVID was really out the gate and we had the Black Lives Matter protest um, about to and that was a core part of the project. 
So then the first paper, which is currently under review at the American Journal of College Mental Health, draws on the Healthy Mind Study, which was, and we drew specifically on the data set that was collected in 2019. And so it included 589 Black college students, 52% of them were women, and they were at 15 racially diverse institutions across the U.S. So when we were thinking about, let me explain a little bit about linked fate. It was this idea of Black college students' perceptions of mental health and institutional climate being linked to other historically and structurally marginalized groups in higher education. Um, so not only thinking about how Black students are doing on campus themselves, but how do they see the institutions treating other groups, right? We specifically focused on first generation students, lower income students, um, racial ethnic minority students, women and LGBTQ students. And a caveat there is that we recognize that Black students are within each of these groups. But again, when you're using secondary data, you are limited to the confines of what's available. And so those were the specific demographic groups available in Healthy Mind. And we examined the effects of institutional diversity climate. So Black students' perceptions of the diversity climate for these different groups on Black students' sense of anxiety, depression, and positive mental health. And for each of these, um, I'll definitely take, I'm willing to take questions during the Q&A, but I just have a few brief slides to really spotlight the findings and to introduce the data itself. So a brief snapshot um, that we found, in general, we found moderately high levels of anxiety and depression among Black students across institutions. So we use a series of multivariate analyses and logistic regressions, um, and we control for institutional type in terms of racial ethnic diversity, as well as students' current financial status and past financial status, and we consider GPA. And we were troubled to find that overall Black students weren't necessarily doing well, right? They were reporting, again, as I mentioned, higher levels of anxiety and depression and higher relative to the, to the mean score. So we were looking um, between zero to 21, and their average scores were around 14 to 15 on both of those. The perceptions of the climate being more welcoming to women, immigrant students, LGBTQ students, and students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds was associated with higher levels of positive mental health and lower depressive symptomology and anxiety among the students. I want to pause for a moment to talk about that and then I'll mention the within group analyses. So again, this idea of when institutions are thinking about how to support Black students' mental health, it's important that Black students are saying institutions are treating other student groups well, um, equitably as well, right? And I don't, we didn't find as many studies that talked about this things, not only a linked fate, but about how historically marginalized groups or black students in this sense are thinking about other student communities. They see initiatives related to first generation or lower income students as tied to how they will also be regarded and treated on campus. So we also did some within group analyses with the black students in our sample. And we found that overall black men, black men reported more positive mental health compared to black women. We found that older students reported lower depressive symptomology and anxiety. And again, we talked about that um, a bit in terms of whether older students were more adept at navigating the um, campus climate and they were more accustomed to the institutional norms around campus climate. And so again, perhaps they um, reported lower depressive and anxiety symptoms there compared to newer students who were transitioning to the institutional context. And then we also found, as we might expect, inconsistent with prior literature, that students who had fewer financial stressors reported more positive mental health. So again, I think the study did a great job of kind of confirming some of the things that we know, that we need to su support students financially, that we need to support um, students as they transition to college and think about how they're doing um, in their sense of adjustment. And I think we're also interested in looking a bit more um, at the gender differences. And so thinking about mental health and wellness among black male students, black women students, um, and why those might differ, but then also considering measurement um, and how we're capturing these constructs which leads to limitations and next steps for this particular study. Um, we preclude the students from responding about their intersectional experiences, which I alluded to a bit before. So again, black students are lower income and they are first generation and they are women um, and they belong to the LGBTQ community, but they, they were only able to select, like we were looking at it as though those were separate categories. And so that's a pretty big limitation of the current study. Um, and then the other thing that the cross-sectional nature of our findings prevented us from drawing causal conclusions. So we really see this as kind of setting the groundwork for thinking again about the links between multiple structurally marginalized groups and Black students' mental health and well being. And then another next step that kind of goes along with the cross sectional limitation is investigating developmental change in Black students' perceptions of institutional climate over time. And also thinking about how Black students' um, critical consciousness and sense of leap faith may shift during the college years, which transitions beautifully into the second study that I'll be discussing. Um, which is drawn from the qualitative data that we pulled, um, that we collected in summer of 2020. And so the title of this paper is that something that, that stood out was just the resilience. 
Black Student Resistance in the Wake of August 11th and 12th at the University of Virginia. <clears throat> so again, this paper is currently under review at the American Educational Research Journal. There we, I collected data, me and my research team, with 27 Black undergrad students, 17 women and 10 men, who were in their first through fourth year at UVA at the time of data collection. Um, we collected semi-structured individual interviews, and we used consensual qualitative research methods, so a team-based approach um, to code the data. I won't be providing a lot any more specific information about the students. Again, since the event that I'm actually talking about in the institution, um, I would easily de-identify who these students were. So some of the guiding research questions were, what, what do Black students recall about August 11th and 12th? And how did the events inform their adjustment and sense of belonging at UVA? And the second research guiding research question was, how do Black students perceive the institutional response leading up to August 11th and 12th, as well as the administrative response that occurred afterwards? And I think part of the important part with that second question is noting that it, even if for the nation, it seemed like a sudden event that just happened, the rallies and it was unexpected. There were multiple things happening on campus where students, faculty, staff, Black students in particular, Black faculty, um, and others were saying, we should not allow Richard Spencer on campus. This is going to be a disaster. And so it wasn't, there could have been an a different administration response beforehand, which is something that the students talked about. So with the snapshot of the findings, there were four main themes that we highlighted. And I'm gonna speak, I'm gonna share examples from two of those that are highlighted in blue. One was that August 11th and 12th led to a disillusionment with UVA and reckoning with the university's racial history of institutional whiteness and how they regarded black students and their mental health. The second was racial battle fatigue from the rent and repeat of racial exclusion, which speaks a lot, I would say, to the current election and the Black Lives Matter protests and a lot of what's going on, um, which I would be more than happy to talk about during the Q&A. The third thing that I'm gonna share on is feeling connected to the legacy of Black resistance at UVA among Black students in response to August 11th and 12th. And a main point of the paper was to really spotlight critical resistance among Black students in the community and those who supported them. And then the fourth thing, which was um, endorsed by about three students, was hesitant hope for institutional change. And the research team and I, we talked about whether we wanted to include this theme because so few um, of the students talked about it, but we thought that it was important to say that there were some Black students in the sample who said, hey, UVA seemed to be doing the best that it can, and I do see um, some positive institutional changes. And so that was, while less endorsed than the other three themes, an important um, point to think about in future conversations. So the first thing, which was the most frequent in the sample, the disillusionment with UVA and reckoning with the university's racial history. Within this theme, again, I'll also mention that all participant names are pseudonyms. We see that August 11th and 12th really pushed black students to learn more about the university's history with white supremacy and alt-right nationalist organizations in particular. So the students entered college during a period when many people felt the US was more politically divided than it had been in prior lifetimes. And very few of them knew about some of the more damning components of UVA history like enslaved laborers who worked Browns or the history of eugenics and the Racial Integrity Act of 1924. And so as Lakeisha says, many people are very proud of the fact that they go to UVA. The professor asked us how we interpret the white supremacists who came to Charlottesville on August 11th and 12th. And everybody was like, but that's not us. Which I think is really interesting because I think we're hearing a bit about that um, now as election results are rolling in. The thing that was going through my mind and I was the only black person in the class was yeah, it wasn't students and it wasn't professors but why did they come to UVA? UVA has never done the work to actually understand what the presence of UVA means for the black community in Charlottesville. And it has never done anything to make sure that it's creating a safe environment for people of color other than admitting them in. One of the white guys was saying that he was proud to be a UVA student after August 11th and 12th because the university has increased their dedication to inclusion and diversity, but he couldn't really explain how. What is that? Right, so we see multiple things um, in this quote, which I don't wanna spend too much time here because I have to introduce some other things, but she says, you know, there was a distancing for white students um, on campus where they said, oh, the folks who came to campus, they were not us. But then she says, why did they feel entitled to come to this space at all? And what does that say about anti-blackness and racism and how it's a cultural norm at the institution for black students who are attending? And then I think there's also something very poignant about her pointing out UVA needing to reconcile about what it means to be such an, um, heavy presence in the community of Charlottesville. And we have intergenerational families of black folks in the, um, in the community. And then the last thing with the student who said, you know, there's, there's been such an, in the white student who said there's been such an increased commitment to inclusion and diversity, but he couldn't explain how. Lakeisha said, you know, 
I want to see the actual steps. I want to see the tangible products. I want you to list out for me the increased commitment to diversity and inclusion and show how it has contributed to a better sense of belonging or adjustment for Black students and other historically marginalized groups on this campus. So that wasn't enough for her, right? And then I think the other um, section and theme that I really enjoyed writing up was feeling connected to the legacy of Black resistance at UVA. So student said, I moved in five days after August 11th and 12th. And I remember as we drove on grounds, members of the Black Student Alliance and members of the Black frats and sororities were holding up signs like you belong here and welcome and cheering us as we arrived. That's something that stood out, just the resilience. It had happened five days ago for them too. And they were actually in Charlottesville, you know what I'm saying? So just to see how they put our movement experience above everything else that was going on proved to me that this chapter of Black UVA is showing resilience. That August, I think they proved how Black people come back from racist situations, how to rise above it and use our academics and our art to create something beautiful. And so Rakia really shared with us about the sense of resilience and the legacy of community resistance among Black students and how important this show of community was for them during move-in day and over the first few months and as they gained a sense of knowledge about UVA's history. I'm running out of time to move. So quick takeaways. August 11th and 12th was a powerful representation of UVA's continued legacy and investment to white supremacy among the Black students in our sample. It encouraged a critical consciousness and kind of the socio-political development among Black students who were incoming and who were already there. But as Dr. Chavis mentioned earlier, Black students should not have to experience racial trauma as a normative part of their college experience. And also really hearkening on the significance of the visual and community resistance among Black students, faculty, and administration, as well as non-Black allies. In the paper, we don't spend as much time, although we do do a head nod, um, to the fact that there were plenty, I, well, there were definitely white students, white faculty, and others who have supported um, anti-racist movements at UVA and at other institutions more broadly, but we were really focusing on the Black community in this paper. And so briefly, what's next? Um, Dr. Jones and I, I'm leading a paper on stress and suicidality among Black students and thinking about institutional context and whether that's different for Black students at a PWI and an MSI. Dr. Jones is leading a paper on COVID and Black students' mental health, specifically looking at their perceptions of how the, their institutions responded to the pandemic. And we're also really thinking critically about more accessible and creative ways to disseminate our findings. Um, so thank you for spending this time with me. And I'm, I'm excited about the Q&A and to hear more about the other projects that were funded. Thank you. Quickly, Shauna, uh, uh, before you turn your video off, a uh, quick question of clarification. Uh, the older students in the Healthy Mind study, did you mean in the differences between the older and younger? A uh, question from the audience was, did older refer to older in age or in terms of credit hours uh, classification? Credit hours classification. Thank you. Thank you. So more to come in the Q&A. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lee. Next time, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Dr. Martinique Jones, Assistant Professor of Psychology at the University of North Texas. Professor Jones's grant was entitled Invincible Black Women, an Empirical Investigation of Group Psychotherapy, Psychotherapy Support for Black College Women. In her work, Professor Jones highlights how Black college women may present to counseling providers with culturally distinct concerns many of which are linked to their internalization of what she terms the strong black woman schema, a gendered racial archetype characterized by independence, emotional strength, and self-sacrifice. While black women's cultural strength orientations have been linked to resilience processes and a variety of success outcomes, the deleterious psychological impacts of the strong black woman schema also are increasingly documented. However, few action research or intervention efforts have explored how to mitigate its negative effects. Accordingly, Professor Jones's project uses qualitative methods to explore the utility of a group psychotherapy intervention, Invincible Black Women, developed by Jones and Pritchett Johnson in 2018, in reducing the negative impacts of the strong Black woman schema on Black women's wellness. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Jones.
All right, folks. Um, everyone should be able to hear me. Um, I go, I'll go ahead and get started with my talk for today. Um, once again, my name is Dr. Martinique Jones, and the title of my talk is Invincible Black Women, an Empirical Investigation of Group Psychotherapy Support for Black Women. Here's our agenda for today. In my time, I'd like to provide you with a brief introduction of myself. I'll describe in detail the Invincible Black Women Group intervention, and then I will transition and present highlights from two related studies that have been funded by the National Center for Institutional Diversity and the Steve Fund. So let's begin. Um, I am a licensed psychologist and assistant professor of psychology at the University of North Texas. Prior to joining the faculty at the University of North Texas, I completed postdoctoral fellowships both at Teachers College Columbia University and at the University of Michigan, which is where the paths of myself, Dr. Leaf, and Dr. Chavis crossed. Each of these experiences have contributed to my development and research in the following areas. In the areas of Black women's identity, identity mental health, and counseling processes. And more specifically, my research aims to address three interrelated questions. The first is, how do Black women make sense of their identity as both Black and woman? Secondly, how do Black women's understandings of their identity, and particularly stereotypes about their identity, impact their mental health? And then what are best practices in working with Black women? My work in these three areas have set a strong foundation for my work on the Invincible Black Women Group intervention. My previous studies alongside Dr. Leith and Dr. Chavis have suggested that strength is one of the key descriptors that Black women use to describe their Black womanhood. Moreover, it's not uncommon for Black women to identify themselves or refer to other Black women as strong. And for many women, being labeled as a strong Black woman or otherwise a woman who is emotionally controlled, um, independent, and self-sacrificing is considered a compliment um, and homage to their perseverance and resilience. Though a badge of honor to many Black women, identifying as a strong Black woman time and time again has been linked to psychological consequences among Black women. However, despite this established link between internalization of the strong Black woman schema and mental health outcomes and psychological distress, few researchers have examined how this may translate into clinical practice. And so as a psychologist, I've thought about ways in which how this research can translate into clinical work and really thinking about how clinical work can be used to mitigate the impact of the strong black woman schema on black women's mental health outcomes. So considering this gap in the literature, I developed a study intended to examine the utility of an existing intervention um, entitled Invincible Black Women. This intervention was targeted at working with women who identify as strong, or in the case of the current study, um, invincibility. So the Invincible Black Women group um, centers on promoting self and social cultural awareness among Black women. It seeks to foster connection among Black women. And also it seeks to enhance the utilization of wellness services among this demographic. The group is structured such that it is nine 90 minute sessions that are semi structured and process oriented, meaning that whatever women bring to session each week is what we talk about and we spend some time processing the natural dynamics that emerge within the group. The group traditionally is comprised of six to 10 women. Black self-identified Black women and two facilitators, one of which has historically identified as a Black woman, woman, but other facilitators, white women, other folks of different racial and ethnic backgrounds have also facilitated the group. So IBW in many ways is similar to traditional psychotherapy groups in the sense that it includes a screening of women for their appropriateness of the group traditional group sessions, as well as a final group session, which we refer to as termination. However, the group is distinguished by two components, um, and that is in its outreach and this thing that I would call consultation. So let me start by talking about the outreach component. 
Considering that many Black women, in particular strong Black women, may be hesitant to seek services in spite of their needs, outreach of the IBW group is critical, or IB, outreach for the IBW group is critical. Um, this involves counselors going outside of the counseling center and engaging with Black students, not only um, notifying them of the services that are available, but also reducing the stigma associated with utilization of services. Also, prior to the end of the group, all the women in the group participate in a pre-termination consultation session. In the context of this one-on-one -on -one session, women are debriefed about their counseling experiences. The counselors talk to them about what they believe the woman's next steps may be, growth edges that she wants to, to work on. But most importantly, this consultation session is used to reinforce help seeking. And so once again, when you're working with a demographic of women who may be hesitant to seek services or doubtful about services, that reaffirmation that seeking services is okay is critical. So these are two components that distinguish the intervention. And so as it pertains to investigating the IBW group, my research question was as follows. Basically, I wanted to know what makes it work, what facilitation style, what topics, and what format makes the intervention effective? To address this research question, I sampled 16 Black women extracted from two cycles of the Invincible Black Women group. And the women were asked to complete surveys before and after the group. These questions prop prompted women to think about the components that they thought would contribute to a beneficial group experience, as well as what they believed that they would gain from their group experience. And then after the group, the same questions were posed, but in past tense. So for instance, we asked women, what did you gain from the group? And what, did, what topics did you experience as beneficial? We submitted our results to descriptive and thematic analysis and came up with the following results. All of the women reported having a beneficial experience. They reported the group as being helpful or somewhat helpful. And what's really interesting about the group is that as a, as a result of participating in the group, women reported experiencing enhanced confidence, heightened vulnerability, and increased feelings of support. And so if you think about these last two, last two components here, these are exact opposites of the traditional strong Black woman schema that I described. So as opposed to being emotionally controlled, women say they're now vulnerable as opposed to feeling independent and I have to do everything on their own, they felt like they had more support. So in many ways, the group was, it did what it was supposed to do in terms of shifting this idea of strength. We also found that the format was effective. So going out and notifying women of services, reduce, increase mental health knowledge and reduce mental health stigma. And once again, consultation sessions um, affirmed help seeking behavior. We also found that the semi-structured format of the group enhanced women's ability to bring up what's most relevant to them to session. And so this included topics related to their identity as Black women, discrimination, and other forms of isms that they were experiencing. So based on these findings, we concluded that interventions like the Invincible Black Women group are effective. Um, they not only facilitate connection among Black women, but also support them in addressing some of their culturally specific concerns related to their identity um, and racialized experiences on campus. Now, the conclusions drawn from this study led me to two additional questions. The first question is, who is best suited to facilitate these types of groups? And then the second question is, what can facilitators do to optimize benefits? So with the support from the National Center for Institutional Diversity and the Steve Fund, I've been able to explore these questions more thoroughly. And more specifically, alongside Dr. Leith, I've been able to explore the significance of race and counseling among Black college students. And so as Dr. Leith mentioned, she and I sampled over 40, 45 Black college students and specifically asked them about their experiences of counseling and the services provided by their institutions. In one of our studies, which is centered on Black students' perceptions of race and counseling, we found that Black college students expressed a preference for having Black counselors. 
though there were a subset of students in our sample that said racial matching didn't matter, there were many more Black college students who noted that there were significant barriers in working with non-Black counselors, which included a limited understanding of their cultural experience. Some have been said that non-Black counselors were unable to engage them in a way that contributed, contributed to therapeutic benefit. And many others reported marked benefits to being matched with a counselor who is Black or a Black woman, woman and that facilitates cultural understanding. As it relates to a desire to have a Black woman counselor, Nimaya, which is um, a pseudonym from our sample, she's a first year student, she mentioned, I prefer a Black woman. That similarity kind of will go a long way and I feel like I can be understood and I can feel heard and also seen, which she thinks is important. And so this preliminary data extracted from this adjacent study may suggest that Black counselors may be particularly well suited and well received by Black women and Black students seeking counseling more broadly. However, more research is needed in this area, but it really speaks to the need for institutions to increasingly um, diversify their counseling staff to make sure the staff is representative and also strive to enhance the cultural competence of their mental health clinicians. So moving on to the second question and the final study that I'll present to you today. Answering this question of what facilitators can do to optimize the benefits of the IBW group is the focus of my second study. Myself alongside communication scholar, Dr. Sade Davis at the University of Connecticut, and I will be examining the themes and communication patterns among black women and facilitators and members in the IBW group. More specifically, we'll be examining what is being communicated um, and to the extent to which these messages may be strong Black women affirming or strong Black women shifting. So said differently, we want to know what are women saying to one another that may affirm the strong Black woman schema or perhaps reinforce these um, unrealistic ideals of being emotionally contained, independent, and self-sacrificing? And then what are things that women are saying to one another that supports this shifting? So shifting towards vulnerability, shifting towards independence, and shifting towards self-care. To assess these data, what we plan to do, or to assess this question, we plan to collect data in the form of audio transcripts um, and video from three sessions of the Invincible Black Women group. And these group sessions are going to be focused on strength, strong Black womanhood, Black joy, and sisterhood. And so the transcript data extracted from these um, sessions will give us information about what women are saying in the group and provide us insight as to how we can support facilitators and Black women themselves in engaging in conversations that shift strong Black aspects of the strong Black women schema to that which facilitates and enhances their overall wellness. So at this point, that concludes my pre presentation for today. Um, I would like to, before wrapping up, thank the funding sources, in particular, the National Center for Institutional Diversity and the Steve Fund for having me this afternoon, as well as my collaborators, including Dr. Leith and many, many others. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Our third and final presenter and panelist is Dr. Carmen McCallum, Associate Professor of Leadership and Counseling at Eastern Michigan University. Professor McCallum's grant project was entitled Unspoken Truths, an Exploration of Graduate Students' Mental Health and Well-Being. Professor McCallum's project is part of a larger mixed method study examining the experiences of doctoral students with mental health challenges. In this presentation, she will focus on qualitative data from Black student participants collected at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and the racial uprising sparked by the police murder of George Floyd. Professor McCallum's findings will illuminate students' experiences during these unprecedented times, including experiences as they were attending classes at their respective institutions. An important part of this project's contribution is that it is responsive to the, the great dearth of scholarship on mental health processes, specifically among Black graduate students. I now turn it over to Dr. McCallum.
Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you uh, to the webinar and thank you for allowing me to spend a little bit uh, time in front of you today. Uh, the name of this presentation is Black Graduate Students Mental Health Unmasking Students Experiences. Um, this is a collaborative project and I always think it is important to honor those who work with you. So here you have a, a list of my team and I would just like to say their names. Allison Boone, Susanna Long, Eli Vasquez, Kellen Mackerel Cooper, and Gloria V. Fonseca Borland all contributed to this project. So why Black graduate students' mental health? I think it's important to give a bit of orientation to researchers as, as they begin to study, particularly Black students in this day and time. It has become popular to study Black students, and so I think it's important to give a background of why. So for myself, I am a social worker at heart. I received my MSW from um, Wayne State University in 2000, and because of that training, I've always been concerned about people who experience racism, discrimination, um, and, and any other isms. Individuals who are often pushed to the margins, and especially individuals who look like me. My graduate studies were conducted at the University of Michigan, and at that time, I witnessed several students across doctoral programs struggling with mental health challenges, often feeling isolated and alone, with very little support from departments or the university. These students struggled due uh, along these student struggles in addition to the stigma that comes with mental health. They didn't see that they could reach out for help. And when they did, they didn't receive the support that they needed. I witnessed students stop out and come back and I witnessed students leave their programs completely. It was that that made me interested in continuing to study the concerns of students with mental health challenges. Additionally, there's a pressing need to understand black graduate students' experiences, which leads me to talk a little bit about what we know. There is a mental health crisis in universities. Particularly when we talk about mental health, we focus on undergraduate students, but there is a mental health crisis among graduate students as well. When we look at the literature, we find that depression rates among doctoral students are more than three times higher than the general public. In a study by Evans et al, we find that 40% of doctoral students experience moderate to severe depression or anxiety. In addition, Black students experience racialized trauma due to microaggressions, discrimination, and other isms that they experience while they are on college campuses. This is an extra burden that Black students carry with them as they are going into their doctoral programs. So a little bit on the literature that's currently out there. Uh, graduate student mental health is, uh, research is extremely lim limited. The research that does exist tends to combine undergraduate and graduate students together in their samples. So we don't have a clear understanding of what impacts graduate students. We know that graduate students are uniquely different from undergraduate students. They have a plethora of responsibilities that undergraduate students often do not have. The, the context of the work is different from doctoral students. And so we need to make sure that we are looking at that group of doctoral students separately to understand their mental health challenges. Another uh, group of literature that we have on graduate student mental health tends to combine programs such as master's and PhD. The work of, of a doctoral student is somewhat uniquely different from a master's student's. Doctoral students typically have to complete dissertations. And so that adds on additional uh, coursework or not coursework, additional responsibilities in order to, to get through their program. The relationship between a doctoral student and their academic advisor also tends to be different as they tend to work together on a variety of different projects. I think it's also important to talk about the culture of graduate school. So graduate school exasperates mental health concerns for graduate students. So I like to say, if you didn't have a mental health concern before you came to graduate school, by the time you leave, you will. And so that culture of graduate school needs to be examined. There's also 
a fear or stigmatization that comes with mental health when it comes to graduate school. If you're talking about a physical health concern, typically someone um, under, people understand that. So if you tell someone you have um, cancer, you tell someone you had a heart attack or a stroke, or you broke your arm or your leg, typically uh, faculty members and others in institutions can understand and will provide accommodations. But there's a different type of stigma that comes along when you say that you have chronic depression or, an, or anxiety. If you say you can't come to the lab meeting today because you just can't get out of bed, Sometimes that the people in the lab consider you to be lazy or uninvested in your education when actually you're su suffering from your mental health concern. The literature also points out that departments typically do not provide adequate support for graduate students. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in this presentation. So the purpose of the study is to create a deeper understanding of black graduate student mental health concerns to understand the impact of graduate school on Black students' mental health, and to provide recommendations for institutional programming and support. So the research question for this particular project was what are the lived experiences of Black graduate students who have mental health challenges? This is a part of a larger mixed method study in which 172 students took a demographic survey. In the survey, we also asked several questions regarding their mental health challenges. Um, we asked them to list them and also to take a, a, a scale that allowed us to determine the degree that their mental health challenges impacted their graduate school experience. For this particular project for NCID, we went back to recruit students because the first time we did not really have any students of color. And so due to the funding of NCID and the C Foundation, we were able to go back and recruit 47 students of color, 25 students uh, which were Black. 100% of the Black students we recruited indicated that they had mental health concerns. We did a total of 10 interviews, um, and one of the 10 interviews that we conducted has not been included in this analysis um, due to not meeting one of the criteria. There were six males, three females, uh, in the ranges of age between 22 and 41. They were all PhD students identified as Black or African American, and their listed mental health concerns uh, consisted of anxiety, depression, stress, and PMDD. So we did a bit of open coding to look at emerging themes. Uh, we combined those codes together. We went back through the transcripts, two of the team members each read one transcript, and then we were able to come to con consensus when there were any discrepancies. So what I'd like to talk to you, uh, you about is our preliminary findings. And so I think it's really, really important to understand that we, are, we were con conducting this data in the midst of COVID-19, at the beginning of COVID-19. And then we had uh, the racial uprising with the murder of George Floyd. And so in the beginning, we realized that we cannot conduct these interviews without taking the time to check in to see where students were, particularly with these two issues. In a data analysis, we thought that we would be able to pull apart what was happening pre-COVID and post-COVID. But what we found was that these experiences are transcending how students think about their present situation and also their past. It's also important to know that for graduate students, mental health concerns have increased tremendously since COVID and since the up racial uprising of George Floyd. In a recent study of over 4,000 of US-based STEM PhD students conducted from May to July. The number of students who reported anxiety disorder or major depressive disorder rose 13 to 19 percentage points since 2019. So as we move forward and we think about the research that we're going to, that we want to continue to do on black graduate students and particularly uh, black graduate students or students of color, we cannot separate that from what's happening in their lives. The notion that we have to continue as normal doesn't work. We can't continue as normal because life as we know it is not the same anymore. And so we have to embrace um, where we are in order to figure out where we need to go. So overview of the themes, um, if you consider that this racial uprising that we are experiencing is a pandemic, 
we have the impact of two pandemics, the COVID-19 and racial uprising. We have to tell or not to tell accommodations and participants recommendations. So underneath COVID-19, what we found really, really interesting amongst our graduate students is that they found that this pause that we all experienced as we went into quarantine allowed them to focus more on their mental health. This is actually opposite of what we thought we would find as we began conducting these interviews. But students really said that they were able to, um, because they were not um, out and about, and they were able to sit down and focus on their mental health and they also felt that it was the one thing that they could control. So this student says, it has caused me to take better care of myself. I am making sure I'm taking my medicine every day. What I control is taking my medicine. If I feel I can reach out to my therapist and keep my regular therapy in appointment. And so for me, what it has caused me to do is to hold on to the things I can't control because everything else is out of control. So the students in our study really uh, paid attention to their mental health because of things like telemedicine uh, and be able to reach their counselors through Zoom. They were able to keep their regular appointments and often increase their therapy appointments. Our next theme um, is racial uprising. And so one of the things that uh, we found very interesting and insightful in our data analysis is that all of the black students commented that this, this ain't nothing new. Uh, we've been dealing with uh, police brutality for years. Uh, we have Breonna Taylor, Philandro Castro, uh, Freddie Gray, uh, and we can go on and on and on about the black and brown bodies that have been murdered uh, due to um, police brutality. And so what was really disheartening for our participants was to have others races, um, particularly uh, white uh, individuals, feel like this was something new. And so this um, particular participant said, I've been dealing with a lot of killings and injustices that have been happening. That's always been a part of my life, being a Black woman. Seeing these things happen, but what really, really was annoying is folks finally asking, how are you doing? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Everyone is just having these epiphanies. All of that definitely added to a decline in my mental health, right? So receiving phone calls from individuals you haven't spoken to in the last 10 years uh, to see how you're doing as a black person in society. Students talked about that and that uh, negatively contributed to their mental health. Participants also felt like they had an obligation to be involved in a way that they hadn't been before. So this student said, I feel more of a necessity to be a thought leader in the conversations around diversity. And so creating safe spaces for people to have those conversations is really what has impacted me. Right? So having to step up and be involved in these conversations in different ways, it has impacted students' mental health. And finally, underneath the theme of racial uprising, there is a mental health cost uh, just dealing with the current situation of COVID-19 and also the racial uprising, okay? So every time I hear someone getting murdered, a black person or in my area, a lot of brown people are getting murdered too. It's just like another weight in my chest. It's something that never goes away. But being back in school, it really has changed my mental health because it makes me question everything. It makes me try to figure out what my part is going to be in this. So dealing with the, 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 the weight of the world, also your mental health concern and being a graduate student has taken a toll on, on black graduate students who have concerns about their mental health challenges. We were able to talk to students about pre-COVID and try to ask them to think about that in a way uh, where COVID wasn't involved and to talk about the relationships that they had. And so this theme of to tell or not to tell really speaks to students struggling with whether or not to discuss with their faculty members if they should, that they have a mental health concern due to the stigma that is associated with it. This particular student talks about never really disclosing a whole lot about it due, uh, because of fear of the stigma but then realizing and working and with a particular faculty member that this person probably did need to know what was going on because if they had a bad day, they would, they would need to be able to explain why they couldn't come to the lab or why they didn't get that particular project completed. 
And so they begin to disclose more. And what they realize is once they begin to disclose a little bit more, uh, that their relationship became beta better with faculty members. So it's important, there have been times when I had not disclosed as much, but then it impacted my work. I do need to be a lot more open about this. I think me just growing more as a person and breaking away from that stigma of mental health, I think that's always floating around in the back of my brain. So there's this undue pressure that students have, understanding that there's a stigma associated with mental health and that that stigma may, associate, uh, may disadvantage them in a variety of different ways as graduate students. But oppositely, students felt that they could confide in their peers or colleagues who were in the particular program about their mental health issues and was able to find support. In fact, all of our graduate students that we talked to disclosed to their peers. And what's really interesting is that all of their peers disclosed as well that they had mental health challenges as well. So I think it's, it's absolutely been a normalizer for me because she shared the same experience that I have with mental health with needing counseling and support. Okay. So the next thing is, is accommodations. And so many of our uh, participants felt that the disability and counseling services were not accessible or not useful to graduate students on a multiple of different levels. So when they did disclose that they had mental health challenges, they would be sent to counseling services or disability services, but they found that the resources that they were provided really were for undergraduate students and not geared towards graduate students. So this particular student stated, because it's not like with a dissertation, you get extra time or no taker. That's not the type of accommodation that a doctoral student can utilize and would be beneficial. So time and time again, uh, participants in the study talked about being awarded additional time or being given a note taker or resources of those sources that really didn't help them in their movement in their doctoral program because they needed something different. And finally, advice and recommendations. So our participants had several pieces of advice for students who are considering PhD programs who have mental health concerns, as well as for the institution. And we, we highlighted only a few here. So for institutions, our participants stated that institutions need to provide safe space to have open dialogues about mental health and well-being. We have to move away from the stigma that is associated with mental health and well-being so that students can freely have these conversations and receive the resources and help that they need. We need to ensure that resources and, and services are available to students. And there was also a conversation, especially students without insurance, because sometimes that was additional burden. There needs to be a conversation where we discuss mental health and well-being at orientation. So a couple of our participants stated we shouldn't wait until someone identifies as having mental health challenges because all of us have mental health. It's just a matter of the degree that we're struggling with it at a particular time. And so if we bring these topics up at graduate school orientation, it normalizes uh, having conversations about mental health, which may make it easier for students to disclose when they're struggling. For their peers who are thinking about entering into PhD programs, they said seek mental health services such as counseling and therapy, even if you don't think you need it. So early on when you're entering into the program, make sure you have someone that you can talk to that can help you with your mental health concerns. And connect early with peers as they would be their greatest, your greatest support. So some concluding thoughts based on our preliminary findings. I think the first one is one that I already mentioned, and that is we cannot ignore that we are still in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, individuals are struggling to find their new normal and to move forward in their graduate programs. And we need to honor where students are as we begin to move forward uh, and help them persistence to graduation. There's a stigma associated with mental health, which places unwarranted pressure on students not to be their authentic selves. So a lot of times students are hiding when they have mental health challenges because they're afraid of the backlash that they will receive. Resources and accommodations are currently inadequate for graduate students. So this is an institutional organizational uh, inquiry that needs to happen. How can we, how can we um, disrupt the narrative and disability services to be more accommodating to the needs of graduate students? 
And finally, more research needs to be done, done on graduate student mental health and particularly students of color and black graduate students. There's just, we just don't know enough right now um, and we need to know more. So that concludes uh, my presentation and I welcome your questions. Thank you. Come on back all <laughs> to the presenters. Uh, thank you, Professor McCallum. And again, thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, at this point, we'll ask all presenters to join us as a panel to take up some discuss discussion questions uh, related to both your research projects specifically, uh, messages for and implications for research, um, as well as implications for action. I think it, based on what we know about the audience who kind of signed up to participate in this seminar, that there are people who study the experiences of students of color or black students specifically, who engage in practice um, with both with black students and student of color communities and or people who do both. Um, informally or formally is a part of their kind of work and, and commitments. Um, I first want to just acknowledge, you know, to thank and acknowledge again. So to everyone who is who is tuning in, uh, we awarded uh, these grants uh, early in 2020. I think it was in February, and you know, uh, lots of things about the world changed since that time, and and uh, these scholars were able to pivot and execute their work, um, you know, slowed by all of the things that slowed our world during the pandemic and, you know, and also, you know, both physically and mentally, um, and, and also in the context of our, you know, spring and continuing racial kind of uprising um, in our country, and hopefully that is serving as a reckoning in some ways. So to be able to engage in this work and to move forward and to be here in November early November at a point where you're able to pr pr uh, present some of your findings and even kind of give us a lens on some of your ongoing work um, is truly appreciated. It's amazing. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that and, um, you know, and thank you again for that. Um, in this discussion, I'm going to take a little bit, we're going to take some uh, questions that were also were submitted as well as you know, take up questions that might be specific to your particular projects, um, as well as some broader questions that each of you might kind of take a lens in answering. So I guess first I want to, uh, I guess for each of you briefly, what would you name as kind of the biggest takeaway from your research findings um, that you think are important for researchers of black college students, mental health to, um, experiences to know, things that were strict, surprising or most striking to you? And any of you can go first. I don't. <laughs> You're not a shy group. <laughs> I can go. Um, I think, um, did you say what was more something that was uh, surprising? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think I mentioned some of that in my presentation. I was really surprised at the degree that individuals were able to take care of themselves and recognize that this was a point in time when they needed to pause and take care of themselves. I think it was a reminder for me uh, when I was spinning out of control <laughs> that I needed to take some time and take care of myself. And I think also this acute awareness of how race does intersect with their experience as, a, as, as students, as graduate students, but also with their mental health. And so many of the participants talked about um, there's already a stigma uh, of them being a Black student and whether or not they belonged in these predominantly white spaces. But then in addition to that, they had a, another layer, which was their mental health. And so they didn't want to expose that and have yet another thing that may be used against them. And so I think that really need to be, needs to be unpacked and that as we're exploring graduate students' mental health, we really do need to uh, kind of segregate our, our research in order to be able to dive into this particular population because I do think that there are unique things that are happening with Black graduate students regarding mental health um, that need to be uncovered. I can um, jump in here off of Dr. McCallum's point. So there were two main things that I would say. One is that um, Dr. Jones and also uh, Dina at UVA pushed me more in thinking about how Black students are seeking um, mental health services. So it might not be in the traditional ways of only going to like counseling and psychological services, 
but some of the questions that we actually tailored and asked um, when the pandemic hit and institutions sent students home was, you know, how are you supporting your mental health? What are you doing for your wellness? How are you connecting with peers now in new ways? And so really hearing students talk about um, the ways they were like throwing virtual parties at the beginning. I mean, I think there's more than a little pandemic fatigue then now, but back in March and um, April and May, they were really finding different ways to engage with their peers that I just, I wasn't aware of and that was surprising. Again, thinking as um, Dr. McCallum said about how they were focusing on their wellness and being encouraged or kind of pushed to sh slow down. And then the second thing was that for the UVA students, um, especially I haven't had a chance to get as much into the UNT qualitative data. Um, I was really impressed and surprised by the amount of institutional history these students had. I remember um, one of my faculty members when I was an undergrad talked about how the turnover in undergrad students in particular over four years means that when we come in first or second year, it takes us a while to kind of hit the ground running to understand like the legacy of your particular PWI or whatever institution you're at. And I think at UVA um, with some of the students that I talked to, there was a particular kind of like normalization of them being here like, hey, this is what this dean did. This is what this administrator did. Here's what happened here. And I think while for some students it was quite jarring, I think it was also kind of like arming them with knowledge in a particular way. And again, was this like demonstration of the community here. And so I was, I was pretty impressed by that going through the transcripts. I think for me, um, very much related to Carmen's point, um, I was surprised that women still wanted to participate in group psychotherapy support in the midst of everything that was going on. Um, so they still wanted to participate in IBW. Um, and in the midst of the summer, up until now, I felt, I felt as if there may be other things going on. Perhaps people were fatigued, they just wanted to rest, but women still wanted to connect with one another. And I'm always surprised uh, with what happens when black women connect with one another around healing. So just witnessing that process is also just really surprising and lightning to me. Thank you. I mean, uh, those comments related, I'm going to try to, there's some terrific questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to try to capture what I see as kind of uh, a, a, several of them that kind of uh, around the theme of this, you know, uh, a viewer who noticed that each of your presentations and your projects, you know, had a connection to this idea of collective and coping as a, as, as a support for coping and also spaces for where one can be kind of one's authentic self. And so I guess uh, those question posers wanted to hear more of your thinking about the ways that institutions might be build those in, uh, those kinds of opportunities or spaces or structures into kind of the normal institutional functioning, whether it's indirectly in support counseling services or in other spaces um, in university settings. Yeah, I think that's the natural way to, to address this question is by building it into some of the counseling services. So making Black counselors available, having culturally responsive interventions available for students and making sure students are aware that these services exist is one way to kind of um, bolster and facilitate that collective support that can happen among Black students. There was an incident um, that happened on campus recently around a multicultural student center at UVA where a Black woman um, asked white students in particular to be mindful of the space um, because apparently like there were more white students coming into a newly renovated space that was a multicultural student center. And so um, in response, the president released a statement that said that the multicultural student center was for everyone, right? And I think I mentioned this because it came up in the interviews where the black students that we talked to were frustrated by that response. And so to your point, um, Tabby too, I think it's also important for institutional leaders to recognize that these spaces matter, that putting funding and institutional backing behind these spaces matter, um, both formal like cultural centers, um, black student centers, et cetera, departments, hiring faculty, et cetera, and then also informal spaces. And that again, I think kind of the focus on institutional climate, when there are these moments, like the incident that happened with the Multicultural Student Center, they were frustrated when there seemed to be this general, what one student said, like a cop out to say like, oh, this space is for everyone when they could instead have said like, we designed this space to be for, students, or for, to be for students of color and for it to be a safe space. And now that kind of undermined that message um, when they said, no, it is for everyone. So I think that that's something that thinking about administrative power like in the positions they hold to also back student concerns when they're saying like we need these safe spaces and we need you to also help continue to make them space 
um, continue to make them safe by acknowledging that they exist for a purpose where we can be our authentic and true selves in community with one another. There also was a line of questions and this may be, I mean, all of you can answer, I think it may be more directly uh, uh, directed toward uh, Dr. Jones and Dr. maybe Dr. McCallum about uh, facilitator and counselor race. Um, and so, you know, wanting to kind of deep, dig a little deeper into your, your thinking about, you know, the race of the group facilitator or the counselor. Um, like one question space was, why do we have so few uh, counselors and of, of color, mental health providers of color in these kind of campus spaces? Uh, another question is related to the attributes uh, that if all counselors can't be people of color um, that are most critical um, to help serve and support students, um, black students in this case. So I think there were a line of questions, several questions about uh, from people who are grappling either by being someone who is not, you know, a person of color um, engaging in the counseling space or wanting to know more even about the, you know, for, for counselors of color, what are the critical attributes that they bring? You know, they're not naturally kind of bringing an orientation, but what are the critical attributes that they're bringing that support students that might be scaled or socialized or um, trained, you know, in other, in, among other um, professionals? So that's a, a said a lot of stuff there, but there were like a number of questions that kind of issue resonated with a number of the viewers who posed questions. Yeah, I can speak a little bit more about that research study. And so, um, once again, we just queried students about their perceptions of um, college counseling centers and the services that are provided. We did not directly ask them about the significance of race and counseling, but in students' responses, time and time again, they noted that one of their barriers to seeking services was a limited representation of Black counselors. They said that, these, that Black counselors were better able to understand their culturally related concerns, um, their experiences on campus, et cetera. And there was a sample of students who also noted that by being paired with counselors who were not African-American or did not self-identify as Black, there were some barriers, which included that cultural mismatch. Some even noted that they felt like their experiences were be as a Black student were being invalidated. Um, and so we do understand that not all counselors are gonna self-identify as black, not all counselors are gonna self-identify as black women. And so what that means is, I think there's a couple of different ways to address this, this concern um, and honor the perspectives of the students. I think the first is to continually strive to diversify counseling staff. And so there's high turnover among um, counseling, counseling staff. Um, they're not provided with, um, many times they're short staff, so they have a 30,000 students to serve, but there's only five counselors. Um, in addition to that, they may not be provided as attractive salaries. And so to attract diverse clinicians, we need to kind of think about how we search, recruit, and attract um, diverse people to serve in those spaces. Um, I also think for those who don't self-identify, I would actually say for those who self-identify as Black counselors and for those who um, do not identify in this way, there's an increasing need for multicultural competence. So developing the knowledge, the awareness, and the skills to work with folks who are different from you. Um, just in, though, there, though Black students may be expressing a preference for Black counselors, all of us, um, Black or not, may be struggling in cultural competence. And so one way that one thing that counseling centers can do is to continually train their staff on how to work, work with people who are different from them. Um, so hopefully that answers aspects of the question. And I would just like to follow up. Um, those are excellent points. Um, and then taking it outside of the clinical space is that this is a responsibility of all of us. And so speaking as a faculty member, it's often looked to the black faculty member or the faculty member of color, the staff of color to kind of be creative and come up with ways to think about addressing students who have concerns. And really it needs to be all of our responsibility regardless of our race or gender or any other identity that we have. So I do agree that we need to do multiculturally competence training, not only for those who are in clinical spaces, but for 
all faculty. Like oftentimes it's a cop out to say, well, that's not my area of interest or that's, I don't understand that. I'm focused on my research, I'm on the tenure track. That doesn't help your students who are struggling. And so I think it's really, really important that we all do our own self work in order to best serve students. Um, and there cannot be just faculty of color who's willing to do that work. Thank you. I'm gonna ask a, 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 a project specific question to, uh, to Dr. Lee, Shauna. Um, because, uh, uh, one uh, participant had a question about, you're thinking about your findings from the, um, the survey study that you looked at, um, the, Different uh, levels of well-being between Black um, male and female students, and I guess your speculations about those differences, um, you know, whether they have anything to do with you know potential differences in the populations of Black men and women who attend these universities. Characteristics. One question asked, you know, a disproportionate percentage of Black men on some campuses are student athletes, and may have other kinds of supports built in to support them. Um, are there speculations that you have or analyses that you've done um, around th those differences that you found um, that you have that you'd want to share thoughts about? Yeah, I saw that question, which is a great one. So I actually we didn't consider um, whether there is an athlete demographic question in the data and healthy minds. It's pretty comprehensive on the demographic items that are there. So it might be there. Um, my specialty is certainly not in student athletes <clears throat> or black student athletes, although I know that is a particular experience. And I know Dr. Paul Harris does quite a bit of work on this. And there's also a graduate student, um, Marae Seward at UVA, who does quite a bit of work on black female student athletes. So also throwing in there that black women are student athletes at PWIs as well. Although again, there are different numbers. Um, I think to the point about whether there are other particular roles that student, black students have at PWIs that likely impact their mental health and well-being and their sense of belonging, um, being an athlete is for sure something that's important. So I think that that's a variable we should go back and look at and consider when we keep working with this data set. Um, I guess another question, I think this one is for Dr. Jones. Uh, do you have insights of, from the facilitator perspective in terms of their experiences of challenge in or you know, success in supporting uh, the group? So the specific question in, um, submitted was about reactions of responses to facilitators who did not identify as Black. So there's responses from the students, but there's also, do you have a sense of whether facilitators are cognizant of or grappling with challenges that they may have um, or even um, resources that they might bring, you know, um, additionally when they're trying to engage with students who are not from their backgrounds? Fortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to investigate this question empirically. Um, as for me, as, a, as someone who has facilitated the group, I've always co-facilitated with another Black woman. And so I'm really curious to know what it's like to facilitate the invincible Black woman as alongside someone who does not identify as a Black woman. What's really interesting about the intervention is that it was actually developed by a white woman and a black woman psychologist. And so the group, as I mentioned, has historically um, included one self-identified black woman, but other women have cycled in and out in terms of co-facilitation. And so I, I don't wanna speak to what it may be like to not identify as a black woman or co-facilitate alongside someone who is not a black woman, because I, I don't have information about that yet, but I imagine that facilitating that group um, and not identifying what in that way may come with some specific challenges. But I look forward to exploring that further. Dr. McCallum, I think a specific question uh, uh, can gear to your project was a question of clarification around a, a disclosure to peers in your um, work, uh, in your project, were Black graduate students disclosing to other Black graduate students specifically or to other student peers? And you know, I think it also relates to the some other questions about um, safe spaces and, and support spaces, um, the kinds of safe spaces that students may have access to. So um, would you mind clarifying um, that part of your study? Mm -hmm. So the participants didn't specifically say whether or not the disclosure were to other Black students. They just talked about Black students, um, students in general, and, and forming a cohort and support group, and then getting to a point where they felt comfortable, and then disclosing that they had mental health challenges, and then really finding that uh, 
the other students had mental health challenges too, which became a source of support. So they didn't necessarily connect that or, or mention specifically if those were other black students, but considering the institutions that they went to and the program that they were in, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much guessing that they probably were not um, because often they would talk about being one of the only in their cohort mm -hmm. or one or few. And so with those types of things being mentioned, I can't imagine that there would be a large amount because they talked about talking, being in groups and talking about it in groups. So I'm thinking that they were not necessarily um, other black students that they were disclosing that information to. Thank you. Um, so this is a question I think, Casey, I think that, you know, one or all of you could take up, I mean, we're in the, in the um, spirit of time, maybe one of you taking this up. Should PWI strive to create grittier and more resilient historically marginalized students, or should their focus be directed toward achieving greater racial justice and so that Black students do not have to compromise their mental, physical, mental and physical well-being by being resilient, or should they seek to do both? Um, I see some movement here. So um, um, you all can take it if you can take it in a, in a brief way, but um, I think this is a perennial kind of issue that comes up over and over again around um, supporting students when they show strengths. Um, um, let's shore up their ability to, to navigate the current context um, versus transformation of context. And so what, how does your work in, in your projects, but your work beyond your projects speak to this question? I was so hyped. I saw that question over there, Tavi, and I said, I just wanted to jump in on that um, because I think it has involved a real shift anytime I'm writing a paper or a grant to specifically say that institutional context needs to shift that and to also think about how I'm using resilience. And I think that's one of the things when I said like black student resistance on the second paper, right? So not thinking of resilience um, as something that we need to just improve in black students or other student groups, that that framing itself is problematic and it does put the onus of responsibility on students instead of the context to change. The other thing um, I briefly wanted to mention, because I think there was also a question about um, what can we do now, right? Like in the racial times we're in now. And I think one of the things that came out of the data was the sense that for August 11th and 12th or for COVID-19, like there needs to be good institutional measures in place before these catastrophes happen. I think we see this like just with the pan pan pandemic more broadly and healthcare issues more broadly. We're all like our healthcare system was not at a point where it was able to support communities and then those who are most structurally marginalized suffered the worst and we see that. And so then bringing it back to black college students and thinking about their mental health and wellness, the pandemic was just a moment in time. But if there were better supports in place more broadly, that they would have been better supported overall. And so I think that was a great question. I'm so glad we're like ending on that one. Um, because I saw it and I was like, no, my solution will never be to make Black students more resilient, so to speak. Any other responses to that or? She said it perfectly. I agree. And I will just add, I mean, I think as someone who studies student identity uh, and, and also see a few comments in the chat, um, to note that that concept of grit and enhancing student resilience, and, and particularly the concept of making students more gritty is uh, grounded in kind of an intellectual kind of perspective too. So that the idea that, you know, students don't, you know, we can, we should shore them up because they're deficient of things that they don't have, um, or that it's compensatory. Let's make them more gritty because they don't have other kind of attributes that allow them to navigate successfully college students' spaces such as intelligence and, and other kinds of strengths. Um, and it also assumes that they are already are not gritty. <laughs> you know, um, that students in order to actually successfully navigate these spaces must already be bringing in extra resources and orientations and supports that other students don't have to think about um, as they're navigating their spaces. So I think that was a perfect question uh, to lead uh, leave us on because embedded in all of your research studies uh, was a strength perspective um, in the ways that you characterized, framed, um, and described the experiences of Black students, and also an institutional accountability perspective um, that our job is to, as institutions, is to uh, respond, be responsive culturally, socially, uh, from a mental health and well-being perspective to the needs of students. Um, so with that, I will thank you 
for participating. We have so many other questions that we weren't able to get to. So we actually will figure out some methodology as we post the recording and some resources related to the talks, including some of the, the uh, features from the slides for the, for the uh, participants and for other viewers um, to also figure out some way to, to engage some of these other questions that are really critical, specific to each study or cross-cutting questions across them. Um, thank you, uh, panel. Thank you, Drs. Leith, Jones, McCallum. Uh, thank you, participants, for attending today. Thank you to the Steve Fund for partnering with us on the pop-up grants program in this seminar, which helps support the research by these esteemed scholars. Again, note that the session was recorded and will be publicly available on our on NCID website and social media pages, along with other resources that relate to the themes and the research presented. Um, and for more information about NCID pop-up grants and other programs, visit us at lsna.umich.edu slash NCID. Thank you so much and have a terrific uh, rest of your day and week. This is a interesting week that we're in and hopefully we will have clarity um, for movement forward, regardless of the outcome. There's still fighting that we will have to do to support our communities. Um, so uh, persist all and thank you and have a great day.